Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique. Never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Saturday, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. For those of you who are returning, thank you for coming back. And for those of you who are here for the first time, my show is all about celebrating artists and their body of worth. And boy, do we have an artist to celebrate today, the one and only Penny Fuller. We are both Southerners, uh, she being from North Carolina, I being from South Carolina, and we're gonna talk about that in a few moments. I do wanna let you all know, if you could possibly subscribe to our channel, let your friends know, hit the like button if you're enjoying the show today, and whatever you do, just share the wealth so that we can get more and more people to see this and celebrate Penny Fuller with us. Now, before I bring Penny on, this is uh, March, is Cabaret Month, so we're gonna start with a clip of Penny from the Mac Awards a few years ago, celebrating not only the world of cabaret, but a show that she did by the same title. Here she is everyone, Penny Fuller. Oh, 
Happy Saturday, Penny Fuller. I am so thrilled that you are here. Uh, we made it. We're both here. We um, are. <laughs> you look incredible. The, you, I, I want to say, uh, just to put things in perspective before we start, uh, today marks 379 days since our theaters have been shut down. And I want to ask you, Penny, how are you doing really? in the midst of this crazy world we're living in now? I am very, very happy. I, I, I'm I, not happy about what's going outside. Mm -hmm. but I guess it's because it's a time of my life where I can just sit and think. I'm not rushing out to get a lunch to have fun. I can just be still, I can read, I'm taking classes online. I'm having a wonderful, peaceful time. I am so glad to hear that. I think of this time that we're going through as a pause. It's a time for all of us to pause and think about what we had, what we have, and what we want or don't want in our lives. And it's amazing. Uh, my husband, Danny, who you know, we were talking earlier today, and we were saying, you know, it, normally we would be rushing off to see a show somewhere tonight. Uh, we would be rushing off to have dinner with friends, all those things that we still love and want back in our lives. But the t it's time to really uh, enjoy where we are right now and get centered. I love that you yeah. say that. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this. Do you have any type of a structure in your life since you're not rushing off and rehearsing and doing a show or any of the things that we all do in this business? Uh, not as much as I should. I have um, I have had an autoimmune condition. I don't feel bad, but my doctor says you can't go out. So I really, except to go to the doctors, haven't been out for almost 379 days. Wow. She told me about a week ago I could do errands. Oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> That's what I can do now, errands. If I socially, so yesterday I went out and I did errands and I didn't like it. <laughs> but um, so that's been the structures I've had to structure in here. And the interesting thing is, Richard, I have never lived in this apartment. I've stayed in it. I've, you know, come in, thrown off my clothes, fix my, fix my dinner, go to bed, go to the show, go to the show. I have been here every day. It's a fabulous apartment. I didn't realize how I have nine windows on the Hudson River, but, and I don't have a terrace, so I don't have to sweep it, but it's as though I have a terrace the width of the apartment. Mm -hmm. it's, it's wonderful. I am. I, I find that I, I'm blessed with, the, with, with a, a pause, like you said, a pause. Now, and, is this your first StreamYard interview? I've done uh, Zoom. I don't know if I've streamed. I've Zoomed. <laughs> I don't know. Um, uh, you're I don't streaming now, Betty. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I've. I don't think I've been interviewed. I've I've done something where I was telling somebody I was either doing Shakespeare or telling somebody else how to do Shakespeare. But I don't think I've. No, you're interviewing. My, you're my first. Well, I appreciate that. And I, you know, one of the things that I have said in previous interviews is those of us who are now doing this have such an appreciation for the lighting designers and the sound people. This is not <laughs> as easy as it may seem, folks. Uh, and uh, we had a few technical uh, glitches getting here today, but we are here. Guess who had the technical glitches? I'll give you three guesses and the first two don't count. It was oh. me. So Penny, you and I, you know, uh, just about a month ago, I think it was, I interviewed Charles Kirsch yeah. and you wrote to me after the interview. Now I've interviewed you before and this is, you're not gonna believe this, but I did a blog interview with you exactly seven years ago today. Now the real test is how much am I going to remember today? No, I've been I've been reading. Or how much am I going to remember? <laughs> no, but um, but one of the things that you said to me was that you were either going to be an actress or you were going to be an Egyptologist. Um, <laughs> that do you remember saying that? To me? <laughs> now where did that come from? 
when I was in the fourth grade with Ms. Caracchetti, we studied Egypt. And I had, I don't think they have them anymore, but I had those books called the Bookhouse Books. Did you have those down yeah, in the well. And I had the black ones too, which were history books. And I think the first one or the second one was had Egypt in it. And at the same time, we were studying it. And then the, the movie of Caesar and Cleopatra with Vivian Lee, who's every little girl's mm -hmm. heroine, came out. And I got so fascinated with the history of all of it at, at that four, at that young age, I mean, uh, nine or eight or something like that, um, that I really, and I wrote a book. I mean, a, a, yes, a book. It was one of those little blue books. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh, maybe eight pages long, a story. And it was called June's Trip to Egypt. <laughs> and it began, uh, it was supposed to say in the midst of the sandy Sahara Desert lies the little land of Egypt. But I didn't know how to spell midst. So I put in the midst of the sandy Sahara Desert and I thought, oh, it's better, it's better. And I wrote this thing, I, I, I don't know where it is. It must be in, you know, the pile of stuff that's, you know, in the back of the closet. But um, and, uh, that's how much I was fascinated by Egypt. I had an Egyptian um, Uber driver the other day, taking me to the doctor, and he, I told him all about, and he said, "You, uh, I go home every two years. I said, I'm going with you next time because okay. I haven't been yet. Oh, you've never been to Egypt. Let's go together. <gasps> oh, I've never okay. been to Egypt. We'll oh, do it. Dude. We'll go together. Okay. Done. You know, oh, good. Now, on um, other things, and I've had the pl uh, great pleasure of interviewing you on stage a few years ago, and we both discovered that we're both uh, Carolinians. Uh, you're from the Tar Heel State of North Carolina, uh -huh. and I'm from the Palmetto State of South Carolina. But you were born in Durham, but you grew up in Lumberton. Uh, when uh, that's wrong. Okay. I grew up in the north. Oh, but when did you leave Lumberton? No, then I went to Lumberton. Okay. So I basically grew up mostly in uh, Briarcliff Manor, New okay. York, and also okay. uh, I spent a year as in 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 the city too. But then my parents were, and this was a long time ago, so they were divorced. You know, you didn't even nobody's parents were divorced then, but mine were. And so um, my mother eventually married the first love of her life before my dad. And we, and he was living in Lumberton, North Carolina. So we moved down to Lumberton. So I left the North and I went down to the South. Now, I want to ask you, I know that you had an uncle that was in the theater. William David, I think was your uncle's Great. name. Great uncle. Great uncle. And he was in high button shoes on Broadway, but among other things. But were you, uh, when did you first become aware of what you knew to be show business? I think, well, we went to see, my mother had a crush on Ray Bolger. So we went to some Ray Bolger shows too, and I would just watch him. But when we, when I finally went to high button shoes and they told me Uncle Bill was in it. And I kind of wanted to be a movie star. I had movie movie magazines and things. And so I mustn't be Southern now because this is my Yankee time. So um, I, I wanted kind of to be a movie star. And then they had Uncle Bill come out for the weekend. And Uncle Bill had been married to my aunt, my great aunt, who was... Uh, uh, well, they weren't married forever. She was difficult. And <laughs> I must tell you that Uncle Bill um, moved when he became single again. He moved to the Lambs Club. The Lambs, it was called, not the Lambs mm -hmm. Club. And he stayed upstairs in his room the first day they allowed women into the bar. And when... <laughs> When they left, he came down with a flip gun and sprayed because, because of Aunt Dorothy. I'm sorry, Aunt Dorothy. It's funny. Everybody loves the story. You don't mind. Yes, that's great. But anyway, he came out to, to Briarcliff, and he was very serious about the theater, and he started to, showing me about center stage and how stage left is on the right of the audience. I still have trouble with right and left in real life, and stage right is audience left and and center stage and and he told me about the pilot light the light that they leave on in the theater and and I fell so in love with the theater 
from that time on, I forgot the movies. I was going to be in the theater. Now, did you grow up in a household where arts were the exception or the rule? I would say the rule. My mother was uh, uh, wanted to have been a classical pianist, and she was wonderful. And the other day, I was listening to some Chopin. And I thought, why do I, oh, I know why I know all these Chopin preludes and stuff so well. It's because I grew up with them. She played them in the Rhapsody in Blue and the Warsaw Concerto and all those things that, be, and she was so good. And I tell all of my pianists, I said, you should be glad she's not here because she could play anything, any style and any key as well as classical music. So, and my father was not an artist, but he was, I, I've come to understand that all that whistling that he used to do that I didn't understand was scat whistling. And he was real jazz. I mean, he adored music. He adored music. He adored the theater. So uh, it was in our ambiance. But no did you have exposure to uh, either drama or music when you were in school? Uh, in Lumberton, um, we had uh, a French class, and I played in the French play, uh, Matt Sam Malgré Louis. <laughs> and then, then the, the senior play, there was this funny part, and I wanted that part, and Miss, Miss Hamilton gave me the lead. And I was so upset. And Mother said, you know, I think she gave it to you because it'll look better when it says you had the lead in the high school play than if you had the funny smaller part. Mm -hmm. So, But that was the extent of it. And who were some of the teachers along the way who instilled in you a belief that you could pursue this as a career? Or did you have those teachers? You know, I hate to say this, but I'm a pig. I had four great life-altering teachers. Four. Can you tell us about those teachers and why they were so pivotal in your life? Well, the Northwestern, I went to Northwestern. God bless Miss Davis at St. Mary's Junior College. Mm -hmm. I studied drama with her and she would have us say, the sun is shining. And I went to my mother and I said, I can't go there at next year. So she said, so she said, well, why don't you go to some big place in the, in the Midwest, like Northwestern? She'd never been there. And I went and I found out there was this amazing woman named Alvina Kraus. Now, if you just take the sound of her name. You can imagine how scary she was. Mm -hmm. And girls would throw up before they had to go up on stage. You know, they, oh. but I finally got in there. And one day she broke me like a colt. She, she got rid of all my inhibitions and, and all of a sudden I stood up and I was an actress and she did it. And she followed me. I mean, she supported me. So she knew that I had something that I didn't know. I just knew I wanted to be in, I just wanted to be in the show, but she found my center. And then the second one I had was um, probably, well, maybe there's another one. Well, Richard Burton's, uh, Philip Burton, his not mm -hmm. real father, but his, he was very helpful with the Shakespeare. And then I had, Milton Katselis, who was a lunatic, wonderful, brilliant Greek out in California. And then I had, and he taught me more about contemporary theater. And then I had David Craig, who was Nancy Walker's husband, mm -hmm. um, Nancy Walker, the great comedian. And he taught us. It was in the era when the singers, the leads in musicals were not singers, like mm -hmm. Rex Harrison and stuff like that. So he taught people who were not theoretically singers, mm -hmm. how to make you think they were singers. And mm -hmm. I took his course and I've been doing musicals ever since. And then the last one was my wonderful Shakespeare teacher, Diana Maddox, who was an English actress who became a screenwriter, screen writer, and uh, taught me so much about Shakespeare. So those were my four great ones. And I had lesser ones along the way. I don't mean they were lesser, but mm -hmm, I mean, those mm -hmm, were major. Mm -hmm. But they, look at the, the, oh God, when I think of it now, the, 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 um, the array of different aspects of it. Milton, mm -hmm. it was more like, you know, contemporary theater. Diana was the classics. Miss Krause was mainly, 
Both Milton Katsalas and Miss Krause adored Chekhov. So I got lots of Chekhov uh, work with the two of them. But I was really blessed because they, they taught me so much. And when did you know that you were ready to make the move to New York? Oh, I never even thought about it. I just oh, went. <laughs> you just went? Yeah. Um, well, can, you tell us, can you tell us how that happened? How did you yeah. make it to New York? I know oh, that you had lived here before and you had... Yeah. Uh, I just went. I just went and I found an apartment. I had a girlfriend who was a year older than I was, so she was always there, already there. And she said, oh, I'll help you find an apartment. She found, I found a one-room apartment. I mean, a, what do we call those studios? Mm -hmm. And then I began and I started taking uh, another good teacher, Wynn Hanman, and stuff like that. And then I got in an off-Broadway show. I was a, in the chorus with Linda Lavin, also in the chorus. We started mm -hmm. together in... Okay, it was called George Gershwin off Broadway. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And, and uh, I, just, I just followed my nose. I mean, that's what you did. You didn't think about it. You just went to New York and you went to classes and you went to auditions and you got parts. That's what you did. Well, did you start getting parts right away or did you have any survival jobs that you had to do other than, mm -hmm. or were you very fortunate uh, to start getting work right off the bat? I, right off the book. Not quite the whole bat. <laughs> <laughs> I did do a couple of temp jobs. And when I rewrote, wrongly wrote a check for much too much money, uh, they asked me to not to come back the next day. <laughs> I can't imagine why. I don't know. It was so mean. But the, the most uh, astonishing thing happened, and that was that I got a touring company of one of the most difficult parts I've ever had to play, which was what's her name? in Toys in the Attic by Lillian Hellman. It was mm -hmm. the national tour. And I went out on the national tour playing the ingenue with Anne Revere, Constance Bennett, Patricia Jessel, these and Scott McKay, these wow, athletes, and to do a play night after night after night and be on the road where you didn't really, I mean, you did things, but it wasn't like being at home. Mm -hmm. I, it was my main focus because there was no other focus. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the hardest parts I've ever had to play since, before, during, or since. So that was great training. And then thank God for Jerry Friedman, because he also had gone to Northwestern before me, but he directed a lot of Shakespeare in the park. And so I did some, so I, I mean, I didn't work all the time, but I didn't have a terribly fallow period, I'm so happy to say. Well, there are a couple of elements of what you just talked about that I want to refer to. And one was being on the road. Um, do you enjoy being on the road or uh, some people do, some don't? Where do you fit in? I think I do. I think I do. I think it may be related to whatever that makes me content mm -hmm. to be stuck in the house for a year. You know, there's something about I take my world with me and I make my world where I am, I think. I and don't know you should ask my roommate. Yeah. <laughs> and what was the show that you got your equity card with? I don't know. I think it might have been. I don't know. Oh, it might have been. Oh, you can't tell. Don't let anybody know what I'm going to tell you. Okay. I got a job. I auditioned for these two parts, two sisters or something, in a play called the Moon Besieged, mm -hmm. directed by um, Lloyd Richards and about John John Brown, John Brown and John Brown's wife. And I didn't get the parts, but then they asked me to understudy the two girls. So I said I would. And then one day they said, we're going to put you in the, in the square dance. I said, no. You, see, you have to. I said, no, I don't want to because then somebody will say it was my Broadway debut and I was only an understudy. They said, I said, all right, put me in a hat so nobody knows. So I had one of those bonnets that you couldn't see who I was. By God, somebody found out and it says she made it. listed everywhere you look. It says, oh. this is the show that you made your Broadway debut in. And, you, and that bothers you. No, 
Well, it did. Oh, it doesn't bother me now. When I, I mean, it, it did bother me then because that was an understudy, and I only went on in a dance. And my otherwise, my Broadway debut was taking over for Elizabeth Ashley in Barefoot in the Park. That's a little better, you got to admit. Well, let's talk about that experience. That was your. Uh, you started out with uh, replacing Elizabeth Ashley, and you're starring on Broadway. What was that experience like for you? And that first night that you walk out as the star of a Broadway show, are you absolutely able to be in the moment and drink it all in? I, I don't know if I should even admit this, but yeah. You see, both having been an understudy and gone, thrown, been thrown on and, and, and because when I took over in Barefoot, I'd been over the third act twice. Did you hear me? Twice. I did. And then when I did Cabaret, I told you, I, I or the song that I sang told you that I had two, four rehearsals. I don't know when I, I've, um, the last play Broadway show I did was Anastasia and mm -hmm. I had, oh, a week and a half. I mean, I was stale by this time. Sunday in the Park with George, I had four rehearsals before tech. I'm not used to having rehearsal. And I think that because I was thrown into these impossible situations, I just don't have time to be bothered with all the ramifications. I have a job to do and I do. I think because I I, I can't imagine that I did all that, but I did. Mm -hmm. So and said, I, think that's yes. all. I just had a job to do, so I did it. Do you enjoy the rehearsal process? And what is the rehearsal process personally for you? Oh, I love it. I love it because you don't know where you're going. I mean, you pick a part and you're going to say, oh, I know this gal. I know her. I can relate to her. And then as you get to go in and start thinking and then putting her in context of not only the play, but where she might be not in the play. And you say, boy, oh, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I thought, no, and she's not all like me. And I have to learn more about her. Now, when you are, when you come in to replace someone in a show, how much flexibility are you given uh, to bring as much a penny fuller to the table as possible? Or it may depend on the director. It may depend on the circumstances. Um, when has it been a phenomenal experience for you? And when did was it not so much that experience? And you don't have to tell us which show it was or what the experience was because I'm all about celebrating. Okay. Um, okay. I don't know that it's ever not been celebratory for me. Mm -hmm. um, the the Horton Foot play that I did with Liz Ashley, again, we were brought back together again. Uh, that was a play, I can't, that's the first one that comes to mind that that I had no one, no predecessor for. And I had to create it from the beginning, but it's not. I don't find it that confining because it's 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 just having another point of view that has to be done, just like the play right gives you a little point of view. And if he wasn't writing writing a play, if he was writing a novel, you couldn't do this. But because it's a play, he says, "Here's the character," but you add stuff too. So mm -hmm. it's kind of been like that. I, I mean, I'm, I'm a very good girl, so I would do what I was told of what was necessary for the other actors. Mm -hmm. And then gradually I, they would relax with the new person and I would relax and, and we might find some new things, you know. Now, Penny, how ambitious are you? Uh, you know, you've got the talent, you've, you've got this incredible body of worth as I like to refer to it as, uh, behind you. Um, and, but did you, I mean, were you really ambitious in terms of pursuing a career or as people got to know you and they're familiar with your work and you're called in for certain projects, where do you fit in on the spectrum between being at the right place at the right time, knowing the right people and truly being ambitious in your pursuits? I think I would answer that by saying, even though once upon a time I wanted to be a movie star, I really, and a part of this is Miss Krause, I think, Miss the Preacher mm -hmm. Northwestern, but I wanted to be 
an actress. And I wanted to be able, I finally one time put it into words, I wanted to be like an English actress in America who moved from stage to screen, to television, to little places to go, to go play queen, whatever, or a king, whatever, to big Broadway, I mean, just to do it all, but to do it all and never get categorized to the point where I couldn't do something different next, mm -hmm. I guess. Does that make any sense? Did that that make sense. Sense? And then you were able to create a role on Broadway. Yeah. And that's when applause came along. Can you, yeah. how, how did it all happen for you with applause? How Prince, I was living in California, doing California, because I did not get, um, what do you get when you fall in love? Promises, was, promises. Promises, promises. And I thought, well, okay, if I'm not going to do that, I'm going to Hollywood. So I went out to Hollywood. And Al Prince flew me back, who was not famous for paying for people to fly back. <laughs> okay. David Merrick always got the bad mouth, but I think even Hal was not so good at it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he flew me back to audition for pro uh, company. Com okay. And I finished my audition and I came out the stage door and I can't remember his name now. I'm so sorry if you're dead or even if you're alive. I can't remember his name. Um, he walked by the stage manager. He said, oh, Penny, what are you doing here? I said, well, I just auditioned for Penny. He said, oh, we were trying to get, but they wouldn't pay for you. We want you to audition for applause. I said, what's applause? And they told me. So I came in and I auditioned, and it was between me and this other young woman. And they decided to take the other young woman. And so I went back to Los Angeles. And about however many month and a half or whatever it was later, I get a call saying they want you to come to Baltimore and see if you want to take over in a pause before it goes to Broadway. I said, uh, okay, my head was in the sink at the O'Ray Beauty Salon having my hair washed. And I said, and the phone is in my ear with the water. And I said, when? They said, tonight. And I flew in. That night and the next day, I went to see Applause. And uh, I, I don't know why, but I knew exactly what I had to do. I mean, I knew exactly what, I mean, I could do it that quickly. And I did four days, you know, God forbid, real rehearsal. And uh, that's what it was. And I I didn't have time to worry about it. I, I remember how, um, Ron Field saying, oh, wh wh what are you doing? I said, I'm rehearsing. He said, but if you don't do it the way, how can I fix it? And I said, well, I can't do it that way yet. I have to find it, and then you fix it. So it was a little different vocabulary with musicals. But by this time, I'd been studying with David Craig, and I knew enough and I that I could do this musical. And I also believe that I saw structurally, having watched it, what was needed. It was it, it needed to, she needed to be threatened on some level, even before she being uh, Margot Channing or Lauren McCall. Uh, she needed, but she didn't even know it yet. So it had to be somebody that could take over, but she had to be able to hide her ability and just be sweet and miss nothing. Well, I'd like to share another clip of you performing uh, a number from the show. And I picked this number because I think this sets the tone for who you are as Eve Harrington and where she came from. So we'll talk on the other side. Okay. Presented by the Nederlanders opens this week in Detroit at Gem Theater. Singing a medley of some of Ethel's Broadway hits, please welcome Ms. Rita McKenzie. Video got queued up. That was so really good, as Rita McKenzie. I'm glad you oh my God, the gods went after me. I cannot believe that that clip came up there. Uh, so I guess we're not going to see the clip. It's on YouTube, everyone. Uh, and it's, you know... Uh, Oh, is it one Halloween? One Halloween. Oh. And uh, I can't believe that that clip came up. It wasn't what I was expecting. So my <laughs> apologies. But the show opens and you get your first Tony nomination. I did. I uh, did. What did that do for you psychologically as an actress, uh, positioning yourself? Did it make you want to work harder? 
or where what happened after all that? I I I I think I don't know. You'd have to ask my friends, but I think. It was an, uh, kind of like the more it happens, the more it changes. The more it's the same, the more it changes. It was just, okay, next. Okay, next. Okay, next. Um, I think, you know, I think that's what it was. I don't know. That was a very long time ago. It was frustrating to play such a uh, uh, vicious, ambitious bitch <laughs> as she was. Uh, I mean, it was really hard. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember somebody said to me, I know you must think it's bad when people boo you, but they were booing, not me. They were booing the character because she was fighting uh, at this one point in the play because she was fighting our heroine, Lauren Bacall, Margot Channing. And so I learned a lot about that. I learned a lot about, I learned so much. I can't, I can't spend a day without trying to learn something. You know, I, I just, it seems to me, I mean, it's not like I have to study it. It's, it can be a realize, as Ms. Krause would say, or like, oh, is that what that building across the street looks like when the sun is not shining on it? You know, that kind of thing. Uh -huh. So... I forgot now. I've gone well, through. Hey, well, no, I want to ask you, what is your process for letting go of a character, either at the end of an evening when you have to go home and you just have to check her, leave her back at the theater, uh, or even moving on to the next role for you? Uh, what one character took over for you that was difficult to let go of? I, I that's interesting. I don't think, I think, I don't know. I don't, maybe you could ask all my friends, was I being nasty like Eve Harrington? But I think I know how to leave it at the in the dressing room. I think I do. I mean, I certainly, I'm thinking of the things I've done lately. I, yeah, I think so. I have such a good time. And I know until I don't, till the show closes, I know I'm coming back and I get to try to fix that moment or do that or see my friends or give that, give that song to the audience or give that character or that insight from, to the, I think it's just exciting like that. I don't know. I may be, I may be fooling myself. You know, I've been alone for a year. I, I may be up. <laughs> and let's talk about the transition uh, from stage to film and television. Mm -hmm. You started getting a lot of film and television work. Uh, was it an easy transition for you? The first thing I did was a show called Judd for the Defense. Uh, which was a TV show. I can't remember who was in it, but John Ehrman, a wonderful director, was directing it. And I. it was Margaret Layton and her children, Brian Bedford, Penny Fuller, and Carrie, that lovely actress who died, Carrie, I, all I can think of is Pipperidge, the number from uh, from uh, Carousel. But, but anyway, Carrie. Oh, Carrie Fisher? No, no, no. 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 Uh, anyway, so it was a fabulous. I mean, I was real. I mean, Margaret Layton's daughter. Come on, it doesn't get much better than that. So my first scene, okay, I do it, and I said something like, "No, Richard, you can't do that." And it went woo, 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 through the sound stage. <laughs> and John Ehrman came up and he said in my ear, "Too much." <laughs> <laughs> that was my first. Yeah. And that, is it, was that all the direction that you needed to pull back? And from that point on? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, it's, it's the same thing as what happened last year or two years ago when I took over in, um, when I did uh, Sunday in the Park with George. I don't think we'd had, I don't think I'd worked with uh, Mike's. Mm-hmm you know, wherever they are in your hair or whatever. And so we we had, so the first rehearsal we had on stage, I had the mic on and I'm supposed to say, where is that tree? And I said in my theater voice, where is that tree? And the, the poor salmon. <laughs> I was taught, you know, you have to hit the back of the, 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 the theater with your voice, throw it back there. So, um, yeah. 
What I don't know what you asked me, but that's what no, I No, about the, I mean, if that was the direction that uh, changed everything. Yeah. Um, now, yeah. I want to talk about a pivotal person in your life, and that's Barry Kleinbord. Uh, <laughs> you and Barry, well, you've, I mean, you've worked together, you, you were teaching, you were brought together. Uh, what is it about you and Barry and this incredible chemistry that you two have together in terms of the work that he brings from you and that you bring from him? Boy, if I knew I'd package it and sell it. It's just, it's a communication. I mean, we couldn't be more different. He's from uh, Illinois. He's from a Jewish family from Poland. I'm from North Carolina and New York City, Southern sort of pseudo aristocratic crap. Mm -hmm. And, um, but he cares on the level that I care about what we do. And his imagination is limitless. And mine, I'm slight, not too bad, but I'm slightly intimidated because I'm a girl and I was brought up at the time where you don't, you know, you don't talk too much about things like that and you don't do too much as a girl. And so he is able to lift my, my curtains or whatever you want to call it. And, uh, I um, did you see the show that I got him to write for? I unfortunately did not, but I've been reading a lot about it. Uh, you yeah. were planning to bring it off Broadway. You did it at Fifty Nine East Fifty Ninth Street, and yeah. we did it in Los Angeles, and we did it in Mary Mac at Mary Mac Rep in um, Massachusetts, forget, Lowell, Lowell, Massachusetts. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, so I had done. I had come back to New York thanks to a man named Michael Bush to do um, a play at the Manhattan Theater Club mm -hmm. back from New York. I mean, back from LA the last time. And, um, and I, it was a three play, three monologue play. And I loved my monologue. It was quite good. I loved the whole thing, but I mean, I loved my part. And so after I, Barry and I got to know each other and he put together a cabaret show for me, I said, I want to read you something. So he comes over. He doesn't remember it this way. And he's probably right because he remembers what he had for breakfast 32 years ago. But um, I read him the play. He said, that's very nice. And I said, thank you. Yeah. Do you think it could make a, a, a one-woman musical? He said, no. I said, why? He said, there's no musical hook. And I said, find one. <laughs> Now he says that's not what happened, but I swear that's what I remembered. And whether it I said it or not, he found it and he did it, and that's where that came from. And um, it's uh, it, he, the character could not be more different from me or from Barry. But whatever that stuff is that inside of us that makes us want to create hit us both in the same way with that and with the cabaret shows that we do. I so, don't know more than that. So cabaret as an art form is fairly new to you. Um, yeah. What is it that you love? This is cabaret month. What is it that you love about cabaret? Uh, what is it that you has shaped you uh, as an entertainer, as opposed to being a performer, being an actress? Uh, what has that brought to the table for you? Hmm. I think, I think probably because it was later that I started doing it, it became more about, I want to say something now. I've been saying other people's words. And though I'm singing other people's songs, I'm interpreting their songs. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably part of, you know, maturing and saying, okay, now I, I think I have some things to say about love now that I didn't know or things I have to say about men that I didn't know and, and romance and life and, you know, whatever. And I think that I'm able to, one is more, a, more nearly likely, however you say that correctly, mm -hmm. uh, likely to be able to do it in song because you're never totally gone from the song and the melody that we all know, but you're putting your stamp on it in some way. And, um, or even if you're doing it the way it's always done, mm -hmm. it's still you 
and you're communicating directly to people. I think the thing about I think the thing about, uh, I guess this is neurosis or whatever, that makes you want to be an actor. Everybody says it's like, look at me, look at me, look at me. It wasn't that for me. It was listen to me. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of chaos going on in the house. And I wanted to say, listen to me. And I think that's what I get to do in cabaret that I can't do because I'm serving the playwright. I mean, it's mm -hmm. partly me. I'm 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 opening up his play, the play her play play but i'm also with a song you can do more of what it is you want to say on it in it have you worked with any other directors other than barry when it comes to cabaret no not really the first cabaret i did i did work with somebody but but we threw it together in such a short time and i was trying to sing his songs uh, some of his songs that he wrote, this man, wonderful writer named Hod David. Mm -hmm. And I, I did them, but I, it was not creating like this, like I do that, but Larry, Barry lives down that street that way. And there's something about the way that Barry and I communicate without saying anything that is great. And when we were teaching, we were brought and we were supposed to do the first, uh, the cabaret. Mm -hmm. And then opened the the, the um, O'Neill conference, mm -hmm. and then we would start teaching. And so we were working on the cabaret. We hadn't done one yet. This was the first one. So we were, you know, feeling each other out. And finally, I said, Barry, uh, the cabaret's on Friday, but you know what tomorrow is? It's our first day of teaching, and we haven't got it. <laughs> and he said, Well, I we got to do this number again. So we rehearsed. So the next day, we start our class. And the first person gets up and Barry says, Penny. And I said, well, why did you start, Barry? <laughs> <laughs> we never didn't see it. I mean, we might have different things to say, but we uh, there was a communication between us that I cannot explain. Mm -hmm. Say, you know, a Southern girl and a boy from Illinois. I don't know. But now, Do you enjoy teaching? I think I do. I think I do because I think it's important. I did, um, you know, Terry Ralston, of course, mm -hmm. and oh, she, yes. she's teaching in uh, Palm Springs. And she asked me to talk to her students the other day on Zoom, which I can do easily. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, um, I realized that I, 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 when I, when I can get the the people who are listening, especially the young people. When I when I feel them, then I know I can take them another step, and I can't explain more than that. Except it's 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 an intuition, a feeling, a communication. I don't know. It's what all of it is about. I mean, that's what to me the theaters is about is that communication. You come in from outside and you sit down, and in the days when they had curtains, which I think are much better than no curtain. No, I agree. You're there you're sitting there, and then the lights go down. And then there's this moment, and then the curtain goes up, and you're in another world. And we on the stage, and we in the audience, the other we in the audience, it happens between. It happens coming from the audience and coming from the actor. And whatever communication or insight or magic or whatever those words are, it happens, and it goes on forever, and it doesn't die. It's still out there. Barefoot in the Park is out there somewhere near Mars, I think. <laughs> you know, for me, it's that magical moment of being in the theater. I also, um, when the show is over, I don't rush for the exit. I sit, and to me, it's like going to a religious ceremony. I want to ask you, with all the roles that you played, um, and these are two roles that I'm going to place on you, and you tell me if they fit or not. And the first role is mentor. Do you consider yourself a mentor? I think I could be. I, I don't, I mean, I, I think I could be, yes. Especially now, because I have developed enough and I don't have the shyness of thinking, well, I don't know anything. Yeah, I can't tell her anything. I think I think I have a lifetime. I'm. That's part of this po past year, being able to see where have I been 
all these years and what have I done? And I do have things that, that I can give that are helpful, I think. And the other role is role model. Do you, would you consider yourself a role model? Well, the better part of me, yes. <laughs> um, I certainly have a wonderful daughter and uh, I, she came from somewhere. I had to help that. No, I think that I, I, I don't know who people are today. I don't know who young people are. I remember I was up at uh, Williamstown. Do you have time for this story? Oh, yes, of course. Absolutely. Okay. I was up at Williamstown doing a play with my pal, Cynthia Nixon, mm -hmm. and a young man, oh, shh, can't think of his name right now. Oh, God, he's a big star now, too. Anyway, so the kids that are the uh, apprentices and do all the hard work, they, um, they get to have uh, a, a little colloquy with us at the end of the thing. And so they come and they ask all these questions about what is it like to be and how do you get into, you know, in show business. And I have no idea, Richard, where this came from. But I said, I have a question for you. And they sort of stood up. I mean, sat up. There were maybe 15 apprentices, maybe, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, when you go to these um, graduate schools for theater, you know, past regular university and then into graduate school and get masters in whatever, um, do you, do the people in the graduate schools, do they help you develop your individuality or do they, because they can see what's going on in New York, do they try to teach you what you will have to do? And they looked at me like I was speaking Serbo-Croatian. <laughs> and do you know what? Do you know? I don't know if you, I'm sure you'll know who I'm talking about, but maybe people watching this morning. But coming across my the screen of my inner life was a bubble with, oh, God, I just forgot his name, Jules Munchen. Do you remember? Oh, yes, of course. Yes. He was such an original. And he came floating by, and I thought, there'd be no Jules Munchen today because they didn't know what I was talking about. You know, it's 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 different, it's a different time. It's it's a different uh, and and it's a different make medium. I mm -hmm. mean, the music is not like Cole Porter. Mm -hmm. And it must be very hard to try. I mean, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but the music sounds quite often a lot alike. And how do you get your individual take on it when it's, um, so I don't know. I forgot what the question was. You no, so you've answered the question about oh. being a role model and oh. being, you know, but being, uh, I, I heard an interview uh, recently and I'm gonna steal a question from that interview because I thought it was a brilliant question. Steal from the best, honey. Steal from the best. Um, mm -hmm. When did you know that you were worthy of what you've created in this business? You know, I would have to say that it happens in phases and stages. That day when Miss Krauss, back in college, broke me like a colt and, and all of a sudden my inhibitions were gone and I was on my way. That was something, but then it's it's different. What's the question again? When did I know I was worthy? When did you know that you were worthy? When I knew that I had to be worthy because she wouldn't have taken the time. So then I had to earn it in my own mind. You know, I had to, and I think it 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 doesn't come easy because you don't sit and say, "Well, look what I've done." Well, that's not bad because you say, "Oh, but I should have done." Oh, and that, oh, if I'd only thought of that, oh, God, why didn't I think of that? Oh, why didn't I sing that song in that show? Oh, what, you know, it goes on. <clears throat> so it takes a while before, and I think this is in any profession. It takes a while before you, that's what growing up is about. And that's what growing older is about, is <clears throat> realizing you have something to give and realizing <clears throat> in your that you might be a role model. I yeah. don't know. I don't know. Um, since you've come into this profession, let's go back to when you got your equity card. Uh, mm -hmm. At this point now, 
uh, the business has changed a lot. Mm. What are the things that you really love about the changes in the business? And what are the things that you really miss that were in place when you first came to New York? This is hard. These are questions. <laughs> the uh, I have to say that we were all more innocent in the 60s, the 50s and the 60s. The 60s with all the political stuff began making us more aware as human beings. Mm -hmm. I don't know who I don't know what it's about now. It's it's a little too entertaining for me and not an, and allowed and it's not enough as I said before about making me come forward like that. It's like it happens on me rather than with me. Mm -hmm. at the theater the, the things that I see for the most part and the things I like are plays that I've seen before or that I've read or that I wished I'd been in or something. And then the musicals, um, I, I'm of the era that liked a melody more than, and, and there's nothing wrong with this, but I'm just used to, it only happens when I dance, dance with you. <laughs> you know that. Yeah. Um, it's it's a weird. It's weird to be. See how easy that was. You start to sing a song uh, from that era, and I instantly can go with you. Yeah. People can sing along. If you were to sing something that's playing on the radio right now, I wouldn't know it. Me no. either. So we are a, we are a product of our time. The important thing is what are we giving back that they can take that and then can put that with their time and not just be their time, but be the, uh, you know, continue on so that the thing just goes on forever and ever and ever. I don't know. I don't know. Well, Penny, one thing I do know, you're the best at what you do. And I absolutely, I, you know, I am a huge fan of yours. Uh, I admire you both on stage and off stage. Uh, I thank you so much. We are at the end of our show. Um, I hope it was fun for you. Oh I know it was frustrating. I know it was frustrating getting here. Oh, um, yeah. it's my, it. my tech stuff is bad. But well, my anyway. dear, it was wonderful. I thank you for this because I, I, I've been, as I say, I've been alone for a, a, almost a year, or no, more than a year, and I, I, I'm finding out what I thought is coming and co communicating to you, and uh, I hope that it makes sense to you and to your audience, and that I'm not some freaky mm -hmm. old broad, you know. Mm -hmm. And I thank you for the opportunity. It well, was wonderful to see you again. You too. And before you go, I want to thank everybody for being here today. Oh, um, and please, Chuck too. Thank you, uh, Chuck. Chuck Pennington, absolutely. Um, everyone who is here, uh, if you haven't done so already, please, please, please subscribe to Richard Skipper Celebrates on YouTube. Um, and you can click, uh, there's a little notification bar so that you only can click on the notifications when you want to be notified about the shows. You're not going to be inundated with emails from me. Uh, you will just get a reminder that I'm about to go live. Please, please, please subscribe if you can. Leave a comment about today's show and hit the like button. See, somebody just got his wings. Um, so um, also, uh, I want to let everyone know, if you are around tomorrow afternoon, I'm going to be uh, celebrating Andrea Infinity Jones. Ooh. In a book called Living Life Goddess Powered. Yes. And it's I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna come. It, it's Thank Women's you. History Month, so please join us. I also end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Go to your That's Facebook amazing. friends list, and the ninth name that pops up, reach out with a phone call. Not an email message, not a text message, not an inbox message, but a phone call and let them know what they mean to you. Because as our dear friend David Friedman says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And you never know what someone else is going through. That's so it. reach out. And Penny, I'm gonna give you the final word. Anything that you wanna to say to expound upon anything that we talked about today, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or just any message 
uh, that you want to put out to everyone. And uh, Rita McKenzie, thank you for popping in, even though it was an accident. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, Richard, thank you, because you did me a great favor, because you made me start communicating what's been roiling around in my brain for the last year by myself. And I thank you. And I, I would pass on that we all know it's been a horrific year and it's not over. And I urge everybody to remember that, but to remember that those of us who are here have come through and there must be a reason. There must be a reason and we have to make the world better. Please let's make the world better. Amen. Okay. I love you. Thank, thank you. you, honey. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anytime. Thank you.